You'll find it helpful to have your Bible opened at Matthew chapter 6. Last Sunday morning, we were introduced to our study of the Lord's Prayer, which will take us, I expect, over a considerable number of Sundays up until Christmas or around then. We are coming to a study of the Lord's Prayer not only as a pattern or model as Jesus gave it to us for prayer, but also as a pattern or model for Christian living. If you think of the two places in the Gospels where the New Testament tells us what the Lord's Prayer is, you will realize the significance of this. There are two places where Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer. One is Luke chapter 11, where he teaches it in response to the request of the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus responds with the words of the Lord's Prayer as a model or pattern. The other place is here in Matthew 6 in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, which of course is an exposition of how we are to live as members of the family of God or subjects within his kingdom. And therefore, in these two areas, we get this dual emphasis that this prayer is a response to a need to learn how to pray, but it also occurs in the context of Jesus' teaching on how to live. And these two things need to be held together. As you will see, it's impossible to divide them because a man prays the way he lives. It is impossible for us to divide between the two. The things that are paramount to me in my daily living and in my daily life will become the things that are paramount in my interests as I come to God in prayer. And unless I am to make the kind of divorce that would render me a complete hypocrite, then the things that I'm living for will be the things that I'll be praying for. And consequently, you can't divide between the way we live and the way we pray. For example, do you notice the preoccupations of the Lord's Prayer here in Matthew 6. It's so different in so many ways most of us would find from our native preoccupations in our daily living, which of course would be with ourselves and our own needs and our own interests. But notice how Jesus teaches us to pray. The primary interest of your praying, he says, has to be in God we begin to pray with things like his fatherly love, his heavenly glory, his holy name, his cause and kingdom, his will and his pleasure. These are the things that preoccupy us in prayer, says Jesus. But of course, you can't pray that way unless you live that way. If this is how I live, then this is how I will pray. But if I am not taken up with God's fatherly glory, with his holy name, with his kingdom and purpose, with his will and pleasure, then it would be the utmost hypocrisy for me to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. And you will realize that it becomes therefore a very searching thing really to pray the Lord's Prayer and a really transforming thing if we begin to pray it from our hearts. Now the point of that emphasis is that the Lord's Prayer is not just a form of words to recite, although I think that it's a valuable thing for us to use the words of the Lord's Prayer in prayer, but it is a pattern or guideline as to how we are to approach God and how we are to speak with him. Now you will notice the preliminary things that Jesus teaches us about our approach to God, which we were helped to look at in more detail last Sunday. 
we are to come to him in a certain way. And in verses 6, 7, and 8 of Matthew 6, Jesus tells us how we are to come to him. In verse 6, we are to come to him with reality. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. That is, we are to come to God, not with half an eye or an ear on the plaudits of men. We are to shut out everything except this one consideration, our Father in heaven to whom we pray. Secondly, we are to come to him with simplicity in verse 7. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they will be, think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. We are to come with simplicity. And thirdly, we are to come with expectancy in verse 8. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him, so we may come to him with an expectancy that knowing what we need and being our Father, he has our deepest interests closest to his heart. But now in verse 9, we come to what is undoubtedly the most important thing of all. When we come into the presence of God, we are to come not only with reality and simplicity and expectancy, above all other things, we are to come with the uppermost thought in our mind that God is our Father and that we enjoy the amazing privilege of the intimate father-child relationship with him of which this speaks, and all the blessings that that involves. So says Jesus, when you pray, this is how you should pray, our Father. Now that concept is crucial, not only for prayer, but for the whole of our thinking about the Christian life. No one has put it better than Dr. Packer in an article that he wrote many years ago in the Evangelical Magazine, and I can still recollect reading it in the 1950s before some of you were born, of course. Here it is. You can find the quotation in the book Knowing God, uh, on which I am collecting royalties for the number of people I've recommended it to. If you haven't read that book, you ought to, by the way. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity... Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For father is the Christian name for God. Now that is wonderfully true, and I believe that it is crucial not only for our prayer, as I say, and our prayer life, but for the whole of our thinking about our position, about the Christian life, about our relation to God, God's fatherhood, our being his children. This is the very core of what the gospel tells us about our relationship with him, but... Everything depends on a right understanding of the phrase, Our Father. What do we mean when we address God in that way? Or more specifically, who may address God in that way? Is Jesus here saying to us indiscriminately, that anybody may come to God and use this mode of address and thereby be brought into the riches of speaking with him within this relationship. Who may meaningfully and truly address God and say, Our Father? Well, let me give you the answer in two parts. The first is this, that this relationship of which this first phrase of the Lord's Prayer speaks is not a universal one. It is a special and particular one. Now that's important to say because the idea of the universal fatherhood of God 
and its corollary in the universal brotherhood of man is not what the Bible teaches us, either in the Old Testament or in the New. And it's a vitally important thing for us to grasp this because Christianity has often been misunderstood as teaching precisely this, the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. But if you come to the Old Testament, for example, you discover that it depicts God as the father, not of all men indiscriminately, but of his own people who are the seed of Abraham. In Exodus 4.22, for example, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And when you come into the New Testament, you find that precisely the same note is sounded. That God is the Father, not of all men, but of those who put their faith in Christ as their sin-bearer, and thereby become the seed of Abraham. Listen to Galatians 3.26. You are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. So what is a son of God in Scripture? Well, sonship is not a universal position of all men, but a unique privilege received through faith in Jesus Christ. Now that is a truth and a principle that it is of enormous importance for us to grasp. Right at the beginning of the Gospel of John, in John 1 verse 12, the Apostle says this, As many as received him, notice, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. The way the New Testament speaks of that is to say that we are not by natural birth children of God. We are rather adopted into his family by an act of God's grace and mercy. And we become children of God, not because we are simply born as his creatures, but when we are taken by the grace of God and adopted into all the privileges and into the status of being God's children by his grace. It is as though a king were to come into the squalor of some place where abandoned urchins were to be found. And he chooses some of them and takes them out of the place where they are and brings them into his palace and dresses them with the robes of their position as his sons and daughters and raises them to the status of sons and daughters of the king. Now, my dear friends, that's what the biblical teaching on adoption teaches us. It tells us that God, the King of glory, has come down in Jesus Christ and has chosen out of all the desperate condition of sinners a people whom he raises to the status of his own children and gives them the privileges of belonging to his family. So Paul says, God sent forth his Son to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's why God sent forth Jesus, because we were not his sons and daughters, and he wanted to adopt us into his family and give us the status and privileges of being his children. And when he sent forth his Son to redeem, it was that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's Galatians 4, verse 4. Now, do you see then the amazing sense in which God has done something in the gospel for us? This is how we come to God and say, Father, 
It is the spirit of adoption within us who cries through us, Abba, Father. And we speak to him as Father because whatever our origin, whatever our background, he has taken us and raised us into the position where we are brothers of the Lord Jesus and children of the same Father. And we cry to him, therefore, Father, as we come to him. But there is another answer to that question. I said there were two parts to it. The first part is that we are not universally children of God. We are particularly and uniquely and specially his children by the process of adoption. But the other answer is that this relationship is not natural, it is supernatural. By that I mean, it is not a relationship that is created by my physical birth, it is a relationship that is created by my spiritual birth. I become a child of God, not by being born, but by being born again. And that is what Jesus urged, you remember, in John 3 on Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who knew so much of the law, who was so skilled in so many ways, but he did not know God as his Father. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again, Nicodemus. Because the only way that he could become a child of God was by the new birth, by being born spiritually. Listen to John 1.12 John 1, again. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now that's how we become God's sons and daughters. If you think of it, that is evidenced in our human family situation. Many of you might be able to come to my father and call him by that name. But I would suggest it to you that it's obvious that only I may come to him meaningfully and address him as father for the very simple reason that I was born into his family and you were not. Now you apply that in the spiritual sphere. This is precisely the language and thinking of the new birth. I call God my Father when I'm born into his family. And the connection between adoption and the new birth is this, and it's very vital. By the process of adoption whereby God comes to me when I am lost and abandoned in my sin and kicks me up and adopts me into, my, into his family and gives me all the privileges and the status of his children, I become a child of God. But by the new birth, he gives me not only the status of his child, he gives me the nature of his child. And that's of immense importance if you think of it. Because I come to him not just as one who has the status of a child of God, but by the new birth I'm given a new nature, and I have the nature I am partaker, as Scripture tells us, in the divine nature. Now do you see why that's so important for prayer? When I come to God and say, our Father, I am speaking as one who has the status of his child and the right to call him Father. But then when I know that I have the nature of his child, then I want the things that God wants. I have new desires born within me. 
I have a new set of priorities in my life. Why? Because I have a new nature and have become a new man in Christ Jesus. And my dear friends, that's the very basis of Christianity. That I have become a new person. And I am therefore able to say, I really want your will, my heavenly Father. Not because I am made that way, but because I've been remade that way. Now that's the basis on which we come to God and say our Father. But even that is not enough. Because if we are to approach God aright in prayer, there are two other matters Jesus refers to in this first phrase, which are of immense importance. One is in the little word, our, and the other is in the phrase, who art in heaven. Let me say just a word about each of these to you. You will notice that Jesus does not teach us to pray, My Father. That's an evidence of the fact that when he says, uh, Go into your own room and shut the door, he doesn't mean physically only pray when you're alone. He says, Pray our Father. That is, you belong to the family of God. We have a relationship that we are expressing and identifying not only with God as our Father, but with our Christian brothers and sisters as members of the same family. So we approach God with a loving concern for one another. And I can never pray, Our Father, if I am careless of the needs and interests of my brothers and sisters in that family, or if I am critical of them and have a spirit that is separating me from them, I can never say, Our Father. So, Jesus tells us in the previous chapter, chapter 5, verse 23 of uh, Matthew, in an earlier part of the Sermon on the Mount, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave the gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. The point is, you see, that nothing kills true prayer or acts as a barrier into the presence of God more effectively than a spirit of resentment or bitterness that divides me from my brother. So the Lord's Prayer brings us into God's presence with a right attitude to God and with a right attitude to one another. But here's the other thing. Our approach to God is not only to God in the sense of the one who has fatherly relationship with us through Jesus Christ, but in the particular sense that Jesus expands in the second half of the phrase, our, fa our Father in heaven, or in the form that we usually use, our Father who art in heaven. Now that, of course, does not mean that God is located in the sky. That's not the significance of the phrase. The, the phrase in the heavens or the word heaven is used in the Bible in three ways, as you may know. It's used, first of all, for the sky above, the birds of heaven, and that simply means the sky as we see it. It's used in the second sp case for the whole realm of space where the heavens are said to declare the glory of God. It's the universe in all its greatness and glory. But thirdly, it's used for the unlimited power and sovereignty and perfection which belong to God contrasted with the limitation and imperfection which belongs to man on earth. So Ecclesiastes says, 
God is in heaven, you are on earth, let your words be few. And he is contrasting God in his heavenly glory and unlimited majesty and power with man with all his limitations. Now you will see that that applies in a special sense to our concept of fatherhood. And Jesus, in the next chapter of Matthew's Gospel, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, compares and contrasts earthly fatherhood with God's heavenly fatherhood. Matthew 7, 9, for example, when he is teaching us about asking, he says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Do you see the contrast? The problem is that we are so ready to think of God as our Father in the way that we think of human fatherhood, with all its limitations, both in wisdom and in power and so on. But you see, when we come to God as our Father, we have to recognize that He is a Father not shrunken to our human concepts, but in His heavenly glory and majesty, with unlimited power, with unbounded wisdom, and with immeasurable love. And these are married together in the God to whom we come and say, Our Father who art in heaven. Now you see what a difference that makes to us in our praying. When we come into the presence of God as his adopted newborn children, we come before one who has all the resources that we shall ever need now that puts a new dimension into the phrase, your father knows what you need before you ask him. If I'm therefore coming to such a God, then what expectancy should flood my soul? What trust in him should dominate my life? What wonder should fill my prayers that God is a God like this and I am actually his child. So I come and pray. Our Father in heaven. And that could send us pondering through all eternity. But it could also transform our lives here on earth. Let's pray together. Father, how blessed to call you by that name. How glorious a thing to be your children. How amazing that you have picked us up from the dust and made us sons and daughters of God. We adore you. We come to you this morning. And pray that we may say to one another, Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us to call us sons of God. And so we are. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.